so not too far from us. Uh, and he is here today to talk about what a Hoosier pattern does, as well as 3D printing. All right. So remember, if you have questions, you can feel free to ask them during the presentation, or if you want to wait till after, write that question down so you can remember. And and I'm Dave Rittmeyer with Hoosier Pattern. I am the customer care and additive manufacturing manager at Hoosier Pattern. I oversee all the design, quoting, and the operations there at Hoosier that's related to 3D printing. Um, deal with customers, work with them, um, implement, help them with any problems they may have, things like that. So I'm gonna go real briefly over what Hoosier does, um, tell you a little bit about our story, take you a little bit of a virtual tour through the shop, um, show you some of our equipment, talk briefly about our apprenticeship, um, tell you my story, tell you how I got to where I am today, and then uh, and go over some 3D printing and the difference of what some of them are. So Hoosier Builds, that's how we start out, is building tooling for foundries. Anybody know what a foundry is? I was hoping for more. We've had a couple throughout the day that know what a foundry is. A foundry is where they make castings. They pour castings out of molten metal, whether it's aluminum, iron, steel, whatever you have. That's where castings are made. So your engine blocks, intake manifolds, steering components, uh, pieces for washing machines. You've got castings in plumbing, uh, your polar faucets. There's castings there. You got a chainsaw, the cylinder. That's a die cast, it's all casting. So we build tooling for foundries. We also have 3D printed sand. That's half of our business. That's what part I oversee. Um, then we also have a plastic printer. I have a couple of them, it's an FDM. Use deposition um, modeling. We'll talk about that here in a minute. So Hoosier started here next week. It will be our 20th anniversary. We started with three owners and about 8,500 square feet of a warehouse. We are now down to one owner, and we have about 42 to 45 of us there at the shop. Give or take. Um, we need a few more, and we're actually. I know it says 50,000 square feet. We're actually occupying about 70,000 square feet at the moment. So we have additive and subtractive manufacturing. So additive can be interchanged with 3D printing. You hear somebody talk about additive manufacturing or 3D printing, it's the same thing. We have subtractive manufacturing, which is the exact opposite. So if you have additive, where you start with nothing and printing and putting something, subtractive, by its name, exact opposite. You're subtracting material. So if you had a, a solid block of wood, plastic, metal, I don't care what it is, and you whittle it down, whether you're drilling, milling, or whatever, you're removing material you're doing subtractive manufacturing. So right here is a piece of 3D printed sand she's inspecting, she cleaned. And here's Joan, he's actually running one of our machining centers, that's part of our subtractive manufacturing. So we're set up like an assembly line in the shop. So Nate, he's our lead CAD guy for the tooling designer. Um, he, they design the tools to make sure they'll work in the foundries. We'll work with foundry engineers, we'll work with the OEMs, original equipment manufacturers, Ford, Cap, Cummins, you name it. We've worked with them. We work with a lot of people you would recognize, some you wouldn't. Um, from there, we'll send it over to Phil, him, or one of the people that's on the same team, and they program all those machining centers. They tell the machines, okay, I have a block this size, this material, I want to use this tool like this and go this fast, and this is how I want it. And they program it up, and then they spit it out to the group out on the floor that then sets the, the, the work piece up, We'll grab tools on the right hand side there, picture some tools. We have a whole assortment of tools for removing metal or plastic. Um, and they'll set them in the machines, they'll set it up like what's here, and then run it. So we have about 25 machining centers total. Um, about 18 verticals, three horizontals, a couple lathes, a couple EDMs. Who knows what a mill or a lathe is? Is anybody in here? I got, okay, good, I got a couple people who know. Okay, if you think of a mill, Okay, you know, mom and dad have a drill hole, right? You see a drill hole? Okay, you've got the spindle, you put the drill bit in. Okay, if I wanted to drill a hole in this table, I'm going to come down and drill it, right? The table or the workpiece is going to stay stationary, but the spindle and the tool is moving and rotating, right? That's the same as a vertical machining center because guess what? You know, the tool's in a vertical position, okay? Horizontal? Horizontal. You know, it's not a big deal. So on a machining center, the workpiece stays stationary and tools move. On a lathe, you chuck on the workpiece and it spins it around and around like the spin the wood, and then the tool comes across and turns and removes the material. That's how they work a little bit different. Um, we got EDMs, the most boring thing in the world to watch. 
you watch paint dry is more interesting. When they run, they, you put the work piece in there, you have you fill it with this fluid, you come down, and there's sparks that chew away. It's actually using the electrical spark to chew away the metal. So you see a spark, spark, puff smoke, spark, spark, smoke. It's really boring to watch. But it's a tool. We need to use it on occasion. Once the tool comes off of the machines, it goes over to our quality department. This is Chris, he'll run the CMM. We have a couple other people that can. And on the end of this right here, there's a little tiny ruby probe. And what we can do is we can use that. If we wanted to measure this block, he can bring that over and bump the side of it with a ruby tip because it measures the deflection. And we can get measurements. Um, you know, we can use that. We can do it for other measurements. If we want, we can 3D scan it. So over on the right hand side here, we got a 3D scanner. You can see this little red line that's going across here. The top puts out the line, the bottom puts out a dot. So if you're in about the right range, the dot's right on top of the line and really close to it. You get too close to the line, the dot gets away. You get too far, it goes the opposite way and moves away. So as we're scanning, we're actually gathering about 50,000 points per second. So the CMM does one at a time each time I bump it. Well, this gets 50,000 points in a second. Big difference between the two. Both of them are very accurate. Um, the scanner picks up all the detail. So if I put my hand on the table, and we've done this, we have customers come through, and we'll just put it, have to hold really still, scan it, and as it scans, it picks up the wrinkles on my knuckles, it'll pick up the pores in my hand. If I keep coming up, it'll pick up the hairs on my arm, and you'll see all of that show up, and it's all in 3D. So if we keep scanning and getting it all, we can rotate it around, if we really want it, we close it off, you can make it into a 3D model, you can print it, you can machine it, you can do something with it. So this is not the laser scanner or copier where it's just getting a 2D image. Once the tools come out of the quality area, they go out to be benched. So vinyl records, you know how you got all the ridges, you can take your fingernail across it and you can feel it? Well, when we machine, a lot of times those ridges are there. This group polishes them all out and they be nice and smooth. So if there's ridges on there, when the tooling would go to the foundry, it could rip the sand out. Um, and that's a bad thing, because then it'll leave a big void and metal will fill it. Um, so these guys polish it all out. So if you've ever built like a, uh, a sand castle, you know how the, the, the buckets are tapered, right? In my world, that's called draft, because it, it'll pull right off. You ever put five gallon buckets together with a little bit of moisture, have any trouble getting them apart? Yeah, near impossible, right? Okay, you think you could build a sand castle with a Pringles can? No way, it never pull out, right? Yeah, because it's straight. That we need draft. These guys polish it, remove all the lines, and then all the engineers at the start, the guys that design the tooling, make sure all that draft's there, and then these guys polish it, make sure that somehow the tool didn't run incorrectly. That way it all pulls apart. We have an active apprenticeship program. We are registered with the Department of Labor. Um, that's what I went through. I have a piece of paper from the Department of Labor that says I am a journeyman pattern maker. Um, it doesn't say Ball State, IU, Purdue. No one likes Ohio State in here, right? <laughs> 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 okay, somebody maybe. Okay, but it, it's the Department of Labor. That I can take that anywhere to any pattern shop and they know I'm a journeyman pattern maker. We have an active um, apprenticeship. We hire a lot of people. Uh, well, not a lot of people, but we'll get them out of machine trades. We'll send them through. Um, our apprenticeship, but they want to be a German pattern maker. We'll get to the sand room. This is a display we have sitting outside of one of the CAD rooms. We work on lots of projects. Anybody ever hear of this little company called Rolls Royce? Yeah, what do they do? What? Okay, they do that. What else do they do? Make hats. Make hats? I don't know. Okay, they may make some cars, but hey, you know what else they're into? Jet engines. Yeah, they're into other things too. Rolls Royce is not just a little company that makes these really high dollar cars. This is actually a scale down turbine that was for Rolls Royce. That was actually a 60 inch diameter. We print, we, on CAD, you can make things big and small really easy, so we did and we sent it off to them. So we worked with them on that. Who likes a big engine in a car? You want a V8 in it, right? Yeah. Right here, this is a core package to make a V8 engine on. We worked with Mercury Marine on that. Uh, let's see here. We had a foundry want to do a gargoyle. Whatever, that's their money. We'll print whatever they want. They can cast it. Who likes Fast and Furious? 
Who wants one of the cards from the past this year? Yeah, I want one too. I don't have any of those. This right here is a water jacketed turbo housing. That turbo housing is like this big. My diesel truck might have one like this. Okay? So we've worked on stuff like that. Got a wire jacket exhaust manifold here for a uh, Mercruiser engine. If you have inboard, outboard, like some of the older the inline six, that's an exhaust manifold for it. Uh, I've got a cylinder for a cart two, which you hear, you know, like the, like Tony Stewart and them, you know, how they start out smaller and you always build up. I'm doing go kart racing. This casting is sent over to Australia. So we've sent product to every continent but Africa and Antarctica. So we're working with people all around the world. We have contacts in Africa, none in Antarctica, because they're white sir. So this is Troy. He's a he's a guy that we hired. He's he graduated a few years back. I hired him, I think, about two years ago. Um, he'll help us. We do quoting in this in the sand room, similar to the uh, the, the tooling guys were kind of something like an assembly line. We'll quote it. We'll design it. Um, he builds a job box. He's got that on his right hand screen there. Anybody ever play Tetris? Okay. Troy does 3D Tetris all day long. That's what his job is. He helps us do quote, helps us doing design work. Okay, on Tetris, when you're filling in the layers, you want a solid layer, right? You don't want any holes because it's a problem. You can't get rid of that layer, right? Well, for us, we want them solid because that's making the best use of that box. It gives us the best product. So what Troy does, he'll fill it in with any piece that we have to print and try to fill it in solid. So we've got a little void over here because this is round. It's hard to fill, tap something to fill in there. I've got a little bit of a void there, but other than that, these guys are in pretty solid. So that's what he does all day. And we have, we have two machines right there. So he builds one for each day. Anybody in here in the Project Lead the Way classes? Good, got one. Okay, anybody ever, okay, got a few more, okay. You guys have 3D printer there, right? Yeah, a little plastic extruder. It prints off something like what that big. That is about the size of a refrigerator. 70.9 by 39.3 by 27 and a half inches thick. Okay? And we're printing that in about 21 hours. If you guys filled your maker bot and tried to fill that solid, it will print for days on end. So we're printing it pretty quick. So Troy takes that file, he says it's a bar or somebody else that's out there, they'll load it in. And both these machines have a job box on either side. And she'll load the file, like right here, you can see the side of a job box, it's in there. So start that up. This one printed the night before. And where it's dark is where it was printed at, and where it's not, it's unbound sand. We'll ink that out, clean it out. Next morning, we'll shuttle that out, shuttle that one in, and start it back up. So how expensive was your printer in the uh, Project Lead the Way class? Anybody have a clue? All right, it's somewhere between two and 3,000, somewhere in there. We have a plastic printer that printed the little blue guy there, my Smurf. It's about $120,000 printer, and it's overpriced if you ask me. There's some that I'd like to have, about $40,000. What do you want to guess these sand printers are? They're either going to be really high or really low. Yeah, okay, that's like really, really high. All right. $1.2 million on the left. The one on the right has a few more bells and whistles. It's about a million and a half dollar printer. So we're out there walking, standing on these things every day. It's pretty cool. They do a really cool thing. So right here, there's some 3D printed molds, and then the casting that was produced from one similar. Um, this is for a 1923 Packard Indy racing car. Um, we've been working with the company over the years. Some people, I, I kind of joke and say it's people with more money than cents. They got more money than they know what to do with, so they say, okay, I'm gonna throw $300,000 or a half a million dollars at this project to rebuild this car. And somebody did it, and then they went through the money, and they said, well, I'm not giving any more, you have to wait for somebody else. Then somebody else came along, and now they're doing it again. So we've done the engine block, we've done the head, and they're redoing this car. Um, it's kind of a cool project, but it, like I said, more money than sense, if you ask me. All right, so here's a picture, a video of how the printer runs. Everybody always wants to see how these printers run. The plastic printers are cool. You can kind of see something take shape. And you'll see that here in a little bit. The sand printers, yeah, they're really kind of boring because there's multiple layers underneath here, but you can't see it. All you can see is this layer right there. So that's the print head. 
whole job box drop, it lays a layer of sand in the print heads that are gonna come back and forth in the printing process. Same as your HP printer does. You know, if you want to print one word or a photo, you still need a full sheet of paper, right? We still need a full sheet of sand. So what the print head will do is come back, just like an HP printer, throw the binder down where it's supposed to, and then the next time it'll go, the box drops, recoder comes, and then the printer head comes back across it again. And it staggers itself, just like these cinder block walls or a brick house, you know, you don't have vertical mortar lines, because it'd be really weak, you want to interlock them, make some strength. It does the same exact thing here. Everybody wants to see the printer run, our customers always want to come and see it run. It's like, okay, you've seen it make two passes, so that's all you ever want to see. And it was really kind of boring, but they want to see it, that's fine. I don't mind showing them. Once we are done printing, we have to extract the cores. So you can see how it's all flush here. The vacuum that's out, anywhere that's dark, is going to be the printed cores. We'll extract those out, and then they'll clean them. They'll use anything from a zip tie to pipe cleaners to welding wires, a little bit of air pressure to clean them out. And then we'll package them up and send them on down the road. So this is going down to Chattanooga, Tennessee, to a company down there. Uh, does a lot with valves and fire hydrants, things like that. And once they get it, this is concrete. This is what if I can get you to hit play. I can't have a good this one, though, sorry. So, all these other molds along the side and those, they did. These are three 3D printed molds. They are getting ready for what I call liquid fire. That is molten stainless steel. It melts at about 2,700 degrees Fahrenheit. Yeah, it's a little hot. You know, if you burn your hand on the oven at home, you know, pull a cookie sheet out, it's probably at 350. Yeah, so now we're talking nine to 10 times the heat. So they have special gear on it. That is not necessarily a job that you want. Does it pay the bills? Yes, it does. But it is a job, not the one I'd want in the middle of summer, because trust me, it is hot. They got the special gear on to protect them. Should they get some poured on them? And let's face it, if they get it poured on, they're still in trouble. So, we also have this burner. This is our Corus 450 MC. Prints a 16 by 14 by 16 inches tall. It's a good size printer. It's about a $120,000 printer. Um, we have those. Um, we're working with a company right now. They're printing some stuff. Um, they actually have the capability to print something from this wall to that wall. And that's like a million or a million and a half dollar printer. So, it can go big. They're getting bigger and bigger. So, if I can get you hit play one more time on that one. So here, here's a, uh, it's a time lapse video for anybody that's never seen a, uh, an FDM printer go. This is how the MakerBots work. You can kind of see it starting to take shape. So it's kind of cool to see and come back on occasion, take a look at it, depending on what you're printing. Like when we printed the um, Steve there, that's the guy that, whose head it actually is. Um, you know, it's kind of neat to see it take shape. But the sand, it's, it, like I said, you can never see anything, so. It's nothing there. And that would take, you know, that's an overnight or, or a day print, one or two. And that's only small. So there's different, seven types of atom manufacturing. That's all there is at this point. There's seven types. It always falls into it. First one's vat polymerization. Um, SLA machines, stereolithography. That's how this was produced. That's this type. Um, it's been around for quite a while. If you notice, there's not really very many layer lines on it. It's very smooth. It does a really good job. Um, yeah, they've come, they're coming out with more and more product to get into it to, I guess, refresh or, or make it keep it relevant. Um, but there's very good uses for it. Um, the next one is powder bed fusion. That's how this was made. Laser sintering. DMLS is direct metal laser sintering. So this metal piece here was 3D printed with lasers. So what it does is put a, a, a powder, which is metal, so a metal powder down, and the laser comes across, and you see it zap, and you know it kind of lights up, and then it does another layer of powder across the whole thing, and then layer, lasers it again, and that's how you get these. Uh, the next one is binder jetting. That's how the sand is done, when you're jetting a binder. So that's how we're doing that. That's the same way this was made. This is made with gypsum powder instead of sand like this on a different machine. And then all the color comes from, because it's actually from um, a, a regular HP print head. But you can go to Walmart, they have the right number, you can buy it, and away you go. Um, 
really cool little thing. You can do full color. Um, like Steve said there, he was scanned with what they call a 3D scent scanner. You can go to uh, Staples and buy it. It's either 450 or 550. I can never keep it straight. And it uses images. So like our laser scanner just gathers points and that's it. This 3D sense uses images. So if I wanted to scan your head from the shoulders up, I'd say, I'm gonna, okay, I'm gonna scan his bust. And I can come around, it uses pictures. Anybody ever use your phone on, uh, the camera on your phone where you're doing a big picture and you go from dot to dot to dot? Okay, this is similar. And as I go and scan, it's going, okay, I'm connecting this image to this image to this image. And it ends up building a 3D model. And then I could actually print him out in color just as I did that, which is it's pretty fun, it's pretty cool. Uh, yeah, material jetting, uh, which is where it's actually jetting the material that you're printing to. Yeah, sheet lamination. Um, this is the first one that I saw back in the late 90s. 3D printing's been around since the 80s. They've been doing it. A little school called MIT has a patent on this stuff. So if you've ever heard of MIT, that's where a lot of this started. Um, sheet lamination is where they literally take a sheet of paper with glue and it has a razor blade that comes around and cuts a profile. And it puts another sheet on the whole thing and does a laser, and I'm sorry, a uh, razor, and it just keeps going and going and going. So, and then when you're done, you have this like solid block of paper that's all glued together and you have to chip it away and then you end up with your part. It's cool, the problem is, is if there's a little bit of moisture, the paper swells, just a tiny amount. So anybody ever tried running a printer or copier when it's humid out, now the paper likes to stick together, it doesn't do things right? Yeah, all right, so the, the, the world I live in is thousands. So if I see a decimal point of 0.1, you're gonna say, oh, that's a tenth, right? Tenth of an inch, somebody? Okay, I got a couple of now I'm gonna say it's 100 thousandths. Cause that's the world I'm living in. Cause I'm going out two more decimal points cause that's the world I live in. Um, then you have people that deal with tenths, which is four decimal points. And that's what they'll, they'll deal with tenths. So it's really 10 thousandths. And they always just shorten it up. That's in the trade. That's, you're gonna talk about so many thousandths or so many tenths. So we won't say everything cause we got enough to say. So anyways, if that paper would swell just by a tenth, one ten thousandth of an inch, and you're printing 500 sheets, if it needed to be exactly whatever that was, guess what, by the time you say 500 times one ten thousandth of an inch, guess what, it's too big. So it can swell, so that's the downside to it. Um, you got material extrusion, which is the FDM printing, which is what he, this guy was done. Um, and this is Steve, he's retiring. Um, the guy who I've been working with for off and on, I think almost 10 years now. Um, his head was scanned with that 3D sense that I was talking about. He's a very accomplished wood carver. He, everybody know who Robin Williams is? Mm -hmm. In Robin Williams' cellar, he has a wine cellar, well, of course he doesn't because he's dead. Um, in his house, there's a wine cellar. Bunch of little Robins in the bottom. He carved them. He's done a bed set for George Lucas. The guy is very good at wood carving. He goes to India and teaches. In a week or two, he's in Berkeley, California, University of Berkeley, teaching wood carving. He's very good. Anyways, he carved a little figurine of a foundry guy, and this guy, except for he's, he's about eight tall. Well, we scanned him a while back, and he wanted a casting. Well, he didn't. He wanted us to make a casting. We never could. Well, he's retiring, so he had had his head scanned um, with that scent scanner here three, four years ago. He was at a track meet. Somebody from Adidas was there and had it because they're scanning the bottom of the soles of shoes to check for some wear or something, I guess. And he sent us the file, like, oh, that's cool. We can't, we printed his head out and sand and left it be. Well, once he heard he was retiring, he told us, we pulled up the model, the guy he had carved, we took his head, merged the two scans together and put Steve's head on the guy. He has no idea he's gonna get this cast. And it's about 16 inches tall, it's a foundry in Canada making it. We can't wait to get it to him. Um, but that's that's what Steve looks like. His braid, his, he has a big mustache too. Um, but that's an FDM printer. You got directed energy deposition. Um, that's another one. A lot of these are very high dollar. Um, the last one is showing is hybrid. That's that's an eighth, but it's really it's a combination of the first seven. You're gonna do one of the sevens and then have a subtractive. That's where you get the hybrid. So what can be 3D printed? Plastics, right? You've got plastic part going around. Sand, well, right there's some 3D printed sand. We know it can be done. Metal, there's a metal part somewhere around here, right? So here's a question. Can you 3D print concrete? Yes. Yep, sure can. 
Through the Netherlands. They got a 3D printed bridge you can ride your bike across. Yeah. Go to China. They're working on 3D printing houses. They'd be rather small, but you gotta start somewhere, right? I've been told they're trying to do a big bridge and they're working it from both sides. I haven't seen the videos on it yet, but I remember Steve telling me about this. Steve's a guy with wealth and knowledge. Really cool. Oh, okay, yeah, how about food? Can you 3D print food? Yeah. Oh, I'm here. Bo, which one is it? Yeah. These are just questions. Yes, it is. What? Yeah, they're 3D printing food. They are doing it. I'm not saying I've eaten. I've never eaten it. I've never seen it. Go on YouTube. You can find it. But they are doing it. To me, I think it's going to be like thick baby food. Let's hope it tastes good. So. Okay, how about tissue? And I'm not talking facial tissue. I'm not talking about blowing your nose. I'm talking about flesh and blood tissue. Can they print it? Yes. Yeah, they sure can. They're working on printing stem cells. They're doing things. There's actually uh, a company in Australia with, the, they're not printing tissue, but they're printing titanium. Anybody know somebody that's dealt with cancer? Everybody knows somebody, you know, or know somebody, right? Okay, you get bone cancer. They're working on a program over there where they'll CT scan your leg. CT scanning in hospitals, right? It's a 3D image. Guess what? It's more than an image. It's a bunch of map data that's 3D. I can print from 3D. So now, say you got cancer in your femur bone. They can CT scan it. They can take that data. They're working on 3D printing a titanium bone. And when they go in for the surgery, they're going to take the bone out. Not just partial, not whatever. And that's what they're working on doing. It's really cool. Who knows what it'll bring? I don't, they don't know if it, how good it's going to be. What, it's just something they're trying. So it's out there. So how did I get where I am today? Well, I got into the apprenticeship. I took classes in Ivy Tech. Um, I completed my apprenticeship. Here's a list of the classes they take nowadays. Um, mine is a little bit different. We've had to adjust as, uh, as the colleges adjust. You know, there's math in there. There's blueprint reading measuring classes like uh, metrology. Um, we now all ask them if they want, they can take English, composition, fundamentals of public speaking to round them out. I take the supervisor classes. When I started the company, there were three owners and one other employee. Now, this is the one owner, I'm the most senior employee and I oversee half the business for them. So I've had to take supervisor classes. I also go to trade conferences. I speak around the country about how to implement 3D printing. I've been out in California, up in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Florida, and I've been all over. Um, and now that Steve's retiring, I'm probably gonna be around a little, getting around a little bit more. Um, but I go around, and when I'm not talking and presenting at these things, guess what? I'm sitting there learning. You have to continually learn, no matter what you do. A high school diploma or just a GED is not going to get you very far in life. If you want to go be one of the people pouring the metal, it'll cover you. Mind you, I think it was this group or the other group, I said they like the drunk drivers because they can't go anywhere, right? They'll need a high education. But if you want to go somewhere, I don't care. I'm a big fan of skilled trades. I like indoor plumbing. I like to flush my toilet. I like to turn on my sink and get water. That's a plumber doing that job. I'm not very good at plumbing. I don't like to do plumbing. But you know what? I need a skilled worker that can do it. That's not college education. But they're getting paid very well to do what they do. I want my teachers, I want my brain surgeons, and my other doctors. I want them to get all the schooling they can because they're cutting on me. I bet you better know what they're doing. You know, it's not an alternative. Skilled trades is not an alternative. I put my paycheck and get a lot of people with college degrees and I'm blown out of water. I got educated with an apprenticeship. You have to get educated and you have to keep learning. I don't care. Your teachers go back for continuing ed. They still go back for school. Doctors go back and get refreshed. If I got a great friend, she's a physical therapist. Guess what? She has to go back and keep learning. You have to keep learning. I don't care what you do in life. Don't stop learning. You have to learn. So everybody always wants to know, show me the money. What am I going to make? <laughs> right? It always helps. But if you go to that machine trades class I talked about, we hire you in, you're going to be making about $25,000 $25, a year, give or take, at 40, 40 hours a week. I forget where it's at, somewhere between $11 and $13 an hour. That's starting out. 
you know what? Yeah, it's not great pay. It's something to start off on because mind you, you really don't know much. Anywhere you start, you gotta start at the bottom. You're not gonna start as the president or vice president. You gotta start some way to go up. You work through the apprenticeship like I did. By the time you're done, you're gonna be pulling in about sixty thousand dollars a year. Actually, that's a little bit low. That's if you worked only forty hours a week. And it's still that's a little bit low. It breaks down to a little over twenty nine dollars an hour is what we're currently paying the dream and having it. So if you're working overtime, you got time and a half, you work Sundays, you get double time. So Sundays you're bringing in nearly sixty dollars an hour. If you're a dream and pattern maker, if you've gone through and done those classes. Remember I talked about all those classes? I'm in charge of the apprenticeship now, and the way it's been and it still is, you get a B or better, you get reimbursed for the class, and I accept it. You get a B minus, guess what? I'm not accepting it. You're going back. And guess what? I'm not paying for that class. Once you get that B the next time around, now I'm going to reimburse it. Guess what? You didn't do it. Third time around? Nah, I don't think so. This isn't baseball. It's not three strikes and you're out. We're going to probably go with two. Because I've got multi million dollars worth of equipment out there. The printers are over a million dollars a piece. The CNC equipment we have out there is anywhere brand new is from two to seven hundred to maybe even a million dollars for some of the big ones that we have out there. You think I want a flunky running that? No. Too expensive. I need the top of the class running those. That's why we pay very well. So where do you end up? I work with all these companies, Ford, Cat, John Deere, GE. Work with a PhD, his name's Kirk Rogers at GE. He's a peer, He's a, he has a doctorate. I know he respects what I have. I very much respect what he has. Now, I do wish I had some alphabet behind my name. Alphabet behind my name, associate's, bachelor's, bachelor's, master's, something. Those letters open up doors. Is it required to get somewhere in the world? Absolutely not. Education is required to get somewhere in the world. But I will tell you that the letters behind your name can open up doors. If you want to work with added manufacturing at one of these companies and be somebody, you're going to have to have some letters behind your name. And they do have classes in added manufacturing at colleges now. They're starting to happen more and more. Added manufacturing is still somewhat new, even though it's been around for multiple decades. It's still coming around. Um, I'll point this in real quick. I'll pour something here if I can get that moment. How much time do we have? 15 minutes. Oh, okay. So here's some sand molds. I've got some tin right here. We're getting ready to melt. So it's going to be, we're going to make the casting just same as they did. It'll be these castings right here. So while we're waiting on that to mount, me to pour it, does anybody have any questions? <laughs> no questions? Well, we'll pour these here in a second. If anybody comes up with any questions, let me know. Uh, we've worked on all kinds of things uh, with people supercharger housings. Who likes Ford? Who likes Mustangs? Yeah, you can laugh all you want. You like garage packages on them? No? What do you want on them? Roush is good stuff. We work with Roush on the superchargers. We worked with on uh, defense projects where the items are a one time use. Nobody's flying in them, but they are airborne. You use your imagination as to what that may be. It's what it is. We worked on all kinds of different projects. Um, we see a lot of cool stuff. They're dying to ask about the benefits versus the uh, positives or negatives of the job. All right, benefits. Uh, of course, I've got. We've got health insurance, dental, vision. Uh, we have some of that. Uh, IRA, which company also contributes to. Um, which is very nice. So if wherever you get, when you start start young, if the company matches three percent, put at least three percent in because that's three percent free money that you're getting tax free and down the road you it'll really pay off. Downside of my job, there's not a lot of downsides for me personally. I love what I do. It's cool. I work with cool stuff. The biggest downside is is uh, there's not very many service centers like us now. We are the first one in the world to do this. Um, so we get a lot of demand. Um, sometimes it means a lot of hours. And when things don't go right, it's a bad day. Because we're, we're doing the sampling, so you're putting sand and gooey stuff through a machine, something bad's gonna happen. Those are my headache days. Those are the days I don't like, um, things like that. But really, I love my job. I, I get up in the morning, I go to my job, I love to go there. Um, 
it's fun. I get to go travel on occasion, meet different people. Um, like I said, work on projects that we can't talk about, can't show. Um, but it's cool because I'm part of, I'm a part of making something that's never been made before. You know, the the, the some of the projects we've worked on, I mean, just they're just they're just super cool. If you can see them or see how we put them together, you know, it, it's, it's just a fun game. You know, we're putting together like if we're doing something really big, printing a we can print the size of a refrigerator. If we need bigger than that, we put it together like Legos. So you have to design it to make sure it's safe to handle. Um, you know, you can get there, it'll stand and stay together. Um, it's pretty cool. You know, sometimes it's just a game in my head. So, but really, I don't have a lot of negatives. I mean, I enjoy it. Enjoy what you do. Whatever you're going to do, try to enjoy it. They might also want to know if there are any dangers related to the job. Oh, yeah, there's, there's any job will have dangers. Um, you know, we make some pieces like that size of refrigerator, right? They're not designed correctly. If something happens, if you get underneath it, guess what? You got well over a thousand pounds of sand getting ready to fall on you, and if any work falls, it could kill you. Um, that's a danger. Um, and it also, it is silica sand, which most people don't know. It's uh, you know dealing with silica sand. It's called silicosis. Um, it is actually lung cancer if you get the fines in your lungs. Um, thankfully, we're way below the ocean limits. Actually, OSHA's come out with some new standards, and we're still way below, so we're safe. Um, that's always been a big fear that we were unintentionally hurting some of our employees. Um, but thankfully, I've had multiple people review and they said, oh no, you guys are like way, way low. They're worried about the people cutting concrete and things like that where you get that big cloud of dust that they're in nonstop. That's the reason they're wet cutting and things like that to reduce that. But uh, there's not a whole lot of dangers. Um, yeah, you get run over by a fork truck if you're not paying attention, things like that. And smash your finger if you get it between something you're not supposed to do. So all in all, it's a fairly safe job. You mentioned the South Adams program. Oh, yeah. Area 18. Yeah. Area 18, South Adams Machine Trades. If you've never heard of it, if you think you're interested in manufacturing with, with a skilled laborer as running mills and lathes, as a junior, you can start taking classes down there. Um, you, you learn how to run manual and um, CNC mills and lathes. And everybody that comes out of there normally has a job before they're graduated. I know my son um, that's coming up, Kyle, is coming in next week. I Hoosier wanted him, and I think he had two or three others that were contacting him trying to hire them. So um, we've had others that were starting them out, some starting some out, $15, $16 an hour starting out right out of high school. So, um, but they don't go as high. We start them a little lower and then take them higher. So if they're willing to wait, they uh, it really pays off for them. So I uh, take that class. Um, National counselors about it, they're very well aware of it. Talk to them about machine trades. Um, if you go through that and then if you get a job somewhere else and become a journeyman machinist, it's similar to what I am, a little bit different. You can go anywhere in the country, go get a job. You say, hey, here's my paperwork, and then you can get a job. That is your, your education. Um, this is, looks like we're about ready. We've got some melted tin here. This is only a few hundred degrees. I'll move. No, if he can't. This comes right from the shop. Actually, we're done. And so these will solidify. They'll get cold. And away we go. So right now they're still jiggling. They're molten tin. Once those solidify and cool off enough, I'll about to grab them out, clean them up, and they'll look just like these. So on one side, we got a little HPI logo, Hoosier Pattern Ink, and then on the other side, we got a little shield that says Nolo Knights. Um, so I have three, four, five of them here. Um, we'll also have them at the career fair. We'll have some there if you're interested in one of them. Stop by, see our booth. Say hi to the listen. I'm not sure who else would be there. So. What else do you guys have? Anything? Yep. <laughs> That's not too good. Well, thanks, everybody. Have a good day.